For all the pleasantries of Pleasant View, the work within was not always a bed of roses. Those called were called to be on watch, working on a high spiritual plane of thought. Clara Shannon commented that what Christian scientists might call working, Mrs. Eddy called watching and praying. There was a great need for the church and our leader. Both were attacked by error, and as our leader and those with her were in the front rank of the battle, it meant watching and praying without ceasing. Clara Shannon. The metaphysical workers were organized to help her wage this battle, assigned to what she termed the watch. Set periods of systematic prayer about specified problems. According to Adelaide Still, Mrs. Eddy might dictate instructions for the watchers to anyone in the room with her. One of the secretaries would then type a copy for each member of the watch. Often she gave the instructions orally. Mrs. Eddy said this morning, I want you to take up the watch every two hours as long as you live, or until you can make the right side real to your consciousness. Now you make real to yourselves. There is no envy, malice, hate, nor revenge. God is love, and love is all. All is health and holiness. There is no opposite. Calvin Fry. Many Wygant recalled the night watches when Calvin would get up at his appointed hour and wrap himself in a heavy red cotton quilt. Clara, in order to be punctual in beginning her watch, bought herself a new alarm clock. She would lie on her bed, fully clothed, holding the clock in her hands. When the alarm bell rang a little before the time to commence my watch, I used to get up and walk about the room to be thoroughly aroused. Then I would begin my turn at watching. Clara Shannon. One day Mrs. Eddy called the workers to her. Their mental work, seemingly, had been ineffective and depressing. She said, in effect, Never become discouraged, dear ones. This work is not humdrum. It is growth. It is repeating and defeating. Repeating and defeating. Repeating and defeating. John Lathrop. John Salkow has said that when she had to pull students up to her level of thought, Mrs. Eddy could be prompt and severe in applying whatever remedy was called for to put the error out of business, in Salkow's phrase. Some workers found such rebukes hard to take. Laura Sargent was one. Salkow was in the study one day, doing some chore, and heard Mrs. Eddy reprove Laura sharply. Mrs. Sargent retired in great grief. When Mrs. Eddy called her again, she was crying. Mrs. Eddy asked her what the trouble was, and Mrs. Sargent replied she felt so badly because she had not come nearer to doing what was right. Why, Laura, Mrs. Eddy said, I was not speaking to you. I was speaking to the error. You should not take it to yourself. John Salka. Oh, she said with great feeling, you don't know what burdens I have borne through the necessity I have felt for rebuking students who could not receive my rebuke as coming from true love for them. James Gilman. John Lathrop received one such rebuke with regard to his assigned metaphysical work. One day she called me to her study and asked me if I was doing my work. I replied, I am trying to do it, Mother. She repeated her question. I replied as before and attempted to explain. She said, Stop, stop, and gave me one of her penetrating looks, which went right through one. I asked you if you were doing what I gave you to do. You replied, I am trying to do it. Now you were either doing a thing or you were not doing it. Were you doing it? No, mother. I was not doing it, I replied. She said quickly, When are you going to do it? Now, I replied. Let me see you do it now, she said sternly. I returned to my room. I knew that if I did not do the required mental work now, I would soon be taking a train to my home. The rebuke to mortal mind to the errors of self-will, self-justification, and self-love had been emphatic and merited, and presently a clear spiritual realization was obtained. At that moment, my bell rang. Mrs. Eddy wanted me. I went to her calmly and found her smiling, sweet, and pleasant. The error had been destroyed. She did not refer to it again, but gave me more work to do. John Lathrop. Mrs. Eddy's admonitions often had an uplifting effect. Minnie Wygant remembers trying time after time to cook a particular recipe properly. One day she received a note from Mrs. Eddy praising her efforts and encouraging Minnie in her struggle with a physical problem. With the firmness and love of a mother, 
and of one who had proved Christian science for herself, she wrote, Know that you can do it, for I know that you can, with love. After that, I was much more alert in applying the truth, and more faithful in my efforts to live up to the name Christian Scientist. Minnie Wygant. Calvin, like the others, came in for sharp correction and reprimand, as she sought to pull him up to her level of thought, as John Salcow put it. Adelaide Still tells us Calvin did not always see the reasons for Mrs. Eddy's decisions. Sometimes he would argue his own point of view, but in the end, he would always obey to the letter. She would say, Calvin, you do as I tell you. And he did. Adelaide Still. April 4, 1902. Mrs. Eddy said today, when Mr. Fry is himself, he can accomplish the work of 50 men in mental practice, but he is liable the very day to be off again. Calvin Fry. Yet Mrs. Eddy also said of him, Calvin is invaluable to me in my work because he would not break one of the Ten Commandments. For years, it had been Calvin who took dictation and typed the drafts, sorted the mail, sharpened the pencils, kept the books, banked the furnace, rode on the carriage box, and kept the watches in the night and in the day. Mr. Fry was so busy, he did not have time to go to the barber shop, and August Mann had to act as barber for him. I took a picture of this operation one morning, which I still have. Minnie Wygant. Calvin carried a heavy burden, managing the household and trying to balance Mrs. Eddy's human needs with her directives as discoverer, founder, and leader. Adelaide observed that no one else was so continually on duty. Subject to call day or night, she never heard of his having a vacation. Calvin's bedroom was his office. John Salcow noted that Calvin's bed lay beside the wall adjoining Mrs. Eddy's bedroom. Should he be needed, whatever the hour, he would be close at hand. By his bedside, two holes were worn in the carpet right through to the floor, a silent witness to the many long vigils in the night when Calvin Fry, instead of retiring, had sat on the side of his bed, alert and ready for his leader's slightest call. John Salcow. Sometimes crusty and curt, Calvin was not popular with everyone. But Mrs. Eddy's gifts and remembrances to him, her praise, even her reproofs, show what she thought of her constant helper. March 30, 1902. Mrs. Eddy told me today that I have done more for Christian science than any other person on earth except herself. Calvin Fry. <laughs> 